welcome to livealittlehigher.com. This week we read two parashas, a double portion of Parasha Matot and Maseh. There are the two last parashas of the book of Badmidbar, and they're usually read on the three weeks before Tisha B'Av. As Alan Dershowitz writes in the introduction to his book, What Israel Means to Me, he says, it's a tiny country barely the size of New Jersey. Its population of six million Jews ranks it among the la least popula populated member states of the United Nations. Yet, with the possible exception of the United States, the Jewish nation of Israel provokes more passion, receives more media coverage, and engenders more criticism than any other country in the world. Today, it is fair to say that few people are neutral about Israel. So what is it about this tiny country, which if you look at in the map, it's like really a little speck uh, surrounded by all these Arab countries around it, huge countries. What does it set us apart from the rest of the world? Why so much coverage? Why is it so important? What, what, why everybody has something to say about it? Why do we care so much about the land of Israel? And what makes it so special? So today many people dispute the legit legitimacy of the land of Israel belonging to the Jewish people. Uh, we can see it every day in the United Nations, we see it with politicians, with the BDS movement, uh, people disputing the right of the Jewish people to live in their land, in their homeland. But thankfully the Torah records quite clear borders instructed to the Jewish people in Parasha Maseh thousands of years ago. And this was given to us by God, none other by God. And God spoke to Moses saying, command the children of Israel and say to them, when you arrive in the land of Canaan, this is the land that, sh that shall fall to you as an inheritance. It's an inheritance, imagine. It's like if you have a, a mansion and you have millions of dollars in the bank and you have a house in the, in the Bahamas and whatever, and you leave it as an inheritance to your children. It's in paper. Nobody can take it away from you. It, it's written down. So the land of Canaan, according to its borders, it's, a, it's an inheritance to the Jewish people. Your southernmost corner shall be from the desert of Zin along Edom, and the southern border shall be from the edge of the sea of, of the of, 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 of the sea of salt, which is actually the Dead Sea, to the east. The border then continues down along the Jordan, and it ends in the Sea of Salt, the Dead Sea. This shall be your land according to its borders around. And this is in Bad Midbar 34, 1 to 13. So the reason these borders are recorded in our Torah is for legal, legal purposes. It's a legal document. It's written as a legal document. There are many mitzvot that can only be performed in the land of Israel. Actually, from the 613 mitzvot, 343 mitzvahs, which is more than half of them, are only to be uh, performed in the land of Israel. So we have some that are concerning the temple. In the times of the, today we don't keep them because we don't have a temple. We're waiting for our third Beit HaMikdash, the third and final one, and God willing will come back and be able to fulfill them. And some are agricultural laws like the sabbatical year, the, Sh the Shemitah year, which is seven years. We plow the land and on the seventh year we let it rest. And this is something that is only done in Israel. Well, you don't have to do it anywhere else. And they cannot be fulfilled anywhere else. So this helps us understand what is so special about the Holy Land. The Torah makes the specialness of Israel even more relevant to us by making it clear that it provides for us a greater opportunity to serve Hashem. So reality, what we're seeing here is that the, the, the land of Israel is important for the Jewish people one of the reasons is because it gives us the opportunity to serve God in a better way, in a more broad, broader way. And that's why it, this is one of the reasons why the land of Israel is so important for the Jewish people. Many of our blessings and prayers are full of our yearning for the land of Israel. We pray the Amidah three times a day, the Shemon Ezra, and we're 
18 blessings, most of them mention the land of Israel. When we do Birkat Amazon, the blessing after we eat bread, we mention the, the, the land of Israel. When we perform in a wedding, there, the, we mention Jerusalem. So it's part of our life. It's part of our everyday life. It's in our psyche. There's not one day that a Jew doesn't go by without thinking about his loved land. And so, as it says in the Amidah, raise a banner to gather our exiles and bring us together from the four corners of the earth into our land. Blessed are you, Lord, who gathers the dispersed of his people, Israel. And every year when we end the, the Pesach Seder and the Yom Kippur prayers in Neila, we say, Leshana Haba Be Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. So this is something that we are yearning for. We're always blessing ourselves to, that we should be next year in Jerusalem. We sh it should be now, it should be now. So until this very day, people kiss the earth when they land in the land of Israel. I remember the first time I went to Israel, I was I think I was 12 years old or many, maybe less. I went with a group of kids that they took us from Colombia. And I remember the motion when we landed and everybody came down of the plane. Now today you go out and there's a, like, a, like a tunnel that you go through. You don't go down into the, into the street. But in those days, the stairs went down and we would come down and everybody would kneel and kiss, and kiss the, 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 the ground. I remember, I did it. There's, there's a story of a rabbi, a very big rabbi, I don't remember his name, but when he goes to Israel, he buys a first class ticket, the first chair in the plane. Why? Because he wants to be the first one to land in Israel. And when he leaves, he buys the last chair in the plane, the last in the back. Why? Because he wants to be the last person to leave Israel. So this is something that is so inside of us. It's in, in, in the DNA. It's part of ourselves. It's part of who we are. The Jewish people are the Jewish people, the Torah and the land. It's a, it's the connection. It's a, it's a marriage. You cannot live one without the other. Other. If you're missing one of them, then we're not complete. So, so, on, so we see here that that Israel is really very important to us. So, a person doesn't need to be religious to feel this love. Actually, there's many people who are not uh, observant of Torah and mitzvot, but nevertheless, they would give their lives for being Jewish and for their land. It is something that is in our DNA. So, what is it that gives us such a feeling of ownership? and belonging, what is it? History can be a great reason and international recognition too. Like we can read books, history, yes, the Jewish people after the Holocaust, the United Nations, they gave it to the Jewish people, they deserve their homeland. We can go back to the inquisitions and programs and everything that happened to us, we can even go trace it to the Torah when the Jewish people left Egypt and even when Abraham came to the land of Canaan. But there is something more than that. As for the historical claim to the land, it is true that Jews have lived in Israel for a very long time. But they, they have also lived outside of Israel for a long time. Like you have Jews living in Rome since the times of the Second Temple. For 2,000 years they, they're there. But nevertheless, they cannot come and say, Italy is ours because we've been here for 2,000 years. Jews has, so we have lived for thousands of years in other places in the diaspora, and this doesn't give us the right to claim uh, that that place is ours. And also, as for international recognition, especially in the days, this is an even shakier argument that, okay, the world can recognize that Israel belongs to the Jews. Many don't, but the, the, the Israeli Declaration of Independence states this recognition by the United Nations of the, give the right of the Jewish people to establish their state is irrevocable. But what would happen if the United Nations would revoke its, its acceptance of Israel as a Jewish state? What would happen if tomorrow they decide no more? The Jewish people don't belong there, they should be given to the Palestinians, and they should leave. This is not for them. So it turns out the only true and dependable claim we have to this land, to this holy land, is simply, and it's very simple, is that God gave it to us. That's the only reason 
that we have a claim to this land. Not because we earned them, not because we have fought wars and we won them, not because we believe it's, it's, it, we have a, a, a right to be there. No, the only reason that we are have a, a claim to this land is because God gave it to us. That's it. So when Hashem established his covenant with Abraham Avinu, our forefather, he promised that the land of Israel would belong to his, uh, to his children, coming from Isaac, to make a, a point there. So on that day, God formed a covenant with Abraham, saying, to your seed I, give, I have given this land from the river of Egypt until the great river, the Euphrates River. And this is in Bereshit 1518. So at the beginning of the book of Genesis of Bereshit, it says, in the beginning of God's creation of the heavens and the earth. And why does the book of Bereshit begins with in the beginning of creation? If this is not so important to us, for us, the most important thing is the mitzvot and the Torah. Shouldn't have it started saying eh, this, month, this month is to you? Because this is the first mitzvah that God gave the Jewish people when they left Egypt was that they had to take, they had to um, keep the Rosh Hodesh, the, the new moon, the new month. So, which is the first commandment the Israelites were commanded to keep. So why then did it start with the story of creation? Why did the Torah start with the story of creation? And the answer is simple. The strength of his works he related to his people to give them the inheritance of the nations. So, for if the nations of the world should say to Israel, you are robbers for you conquered by force the lands of the seven nations of Canaan, they will reply, the entire earth belongs to the Holy One, blessed be He. He is the creator of the world. He created America. He created Europe. He created everything. He is the creator of the world and he created Israel and gave it to whoever he deemed proper. He distributed the world to the different nations and Israel he gave to us. So when he wished, he gave it to them, and when he wished, he took it away from them and gave it to us. So the magnitude of what Rashi is saying, which is humongous, the entire book of Bereshit and the beginning of the book of Shemot, which is the second book of the Torah, exists only for us to assert our, le le our legitimacy of ownership in the eyes of the nations and for ourselves, for ourselves, because it's not only for the nations, it's so we can be reminded also that Israel belongs to us and that we're responsible for it. So now that there is no undeniable proof against our case, let's understand what makes the land so special. So now we know it's ours, we, it's written in the books, we have a paper, we have a, um, a legit paper that attests to it. And let's go back to Abraham now and understand why this land is so special, especially for a Jewish person. And God said to Abraham, go forth from your native land and from your father's house to the land that I will show you. Rabbi Berachia said, what did Abraham uh, resemble? And so it says that Rabbi uh, Berachia says that Abraham resembles to a bottle of perfume closed with a tight fitting lid lying in a corner so that its fragrant smell could not spread. When it was moved, however, its fragrance was spread. Similarly, God said to Abraham, travel from place to place and your name will become great in the world. So Hashem had to take Abraham out of the land of Haran, the land of his fathers, and take him to this desolate land, the land of Canaan, where there was really nothing, and he had to go and spread Yiddishkeit there. He was the first Hebrew. He was the first person that set himself apart from the rest of the world. He was the first person that recognized that Hashem runs the world. Not only that there's one God, because many other people believe there was one God. Even idol worshippers believe that God runs the world, that God, there's a God. But they thought that other forces had control over the world. But Abraham was the first person to recognize that nothing moved in this world without Hashem. So Abraham's mission was to spread the sweet perfume of godliness throughout the world. He was the first Shlia, he was the first Rebbe, he was the first person to bring holiness to the world. And the reason that God sent Abraham to the land of Canaan and away from the land of Haran was that the land of Canaan of Israel, or Israel as we know it today, is the place that God chose to be launching path of holiness for the whole world. So let's look at it this way. Israel is the launching pad. 
This is where all the holiness for the rest of the world comes from. It's like you go to NASA, this is where the, the rocket goes. You know, this is the launching pad. The, the rocket will go to the moon, but this is the place where it comes from. So Rabbi Yehuda Halevi, in his great work, The Kusari, which is a great book about uh, Jewish faith from the 1100s, he echoes this thing by saying, this land of Israel was appointed and des designated to teach the proper way of behavior to the rest of the world. So just as the Torah is the moral compass of the world, is what tells us what is right, what is wrong, in reality, Israel should behave according to the Torah. This is the way we should live. We should live according to the Torah. We should keep its laws and we should live accordingly because this is the, the light to the nations. This is what shows the world the way in which human beings should behave. We're not animals, we're human beings, we're different. And we should behave morally, ethically, lovingly towards other people. Now that we understand the importance and precious mission of the Holy Land, the remaining question is, why this land? Why this piece of uh, land? What was so great about this real estate? What makes this tiny country the epicenter of the world? There's not, nothing there. Like everything has been made by the Jews. Like even flowers weren't growing there. It was a complete desolate place. And why is it relevant to everyone? Why is this incredible country relevant to the rest of the world? Couldn't all this be accomplished anywhere else? Couldn't Hashem chose Uganda or maybe a place in the, in the Alps, in the mountains where there's nobody and there's nothing and nobody wants to be there. So the world is so vast and big and there are places that are so empty. So what is the fight all about? So the Rebbe Lubavitch Menachem Mendel Schneerson of blessed memory said, God did not choose the land of Israel because of the holiness in it. This is not the reason why God chose the land of Israel. It's not that he chose this place because it was holier than the rest of the places. On the contrary, the holiness comes as a result of God's choice. So by God choosing the land of Israel, he makes it holy. But not because this place was special to begin with. So God's decision to choose the land of Israel is an example of Behira at Mitz, an uncompelled choice made of God's own pure uh, free will. He has also uh, free will, Behira. And this is why the land of Israel is the heritage of God, because he desired, this is what he wanted, he willed it. Why? I don't know why that piece of land. He could have chosen any, any other place, but he chose that one. So a good analogy to explain this concept would be like no people, no two people are alike. They're not exactly alike. You can have very similar people, but you will never find two people that are exactly alike. And this fact is easy to prove. God made everyone different. Each person has their own unique qualities, their own, own unique purpose and meaning in the world and mission that make them special and unique and distinct. Yeah, what I can do, you cannot do, and what you can do, I cannot do. Each person has their own job. And it's important that each person does what he has to do because if you're not doing what you have to do, then the world is lacking of you. We're missing out on you. So the same could be said about time, time also. No day is exactly like another day. You're never gonna repeat the same day. What you're living today won't happen tomorrow. What you're gonna live tomorrow won't happen the day after. What you, how you were 10 years ago, you're not now. Time is something that is unique. Every day is unique. Every second, every minute, every moment is unique. And we'll see. Every, every day has its own energy and its own purpose. Shabbat feels different from the rest of the week. Pesach feels different from Shabbat, even from other holidays. And someone with spiritual sensitivity will even feel that every day of the week is different. It, most of us can really see that on Mondays. So we could also analyze this concept regarding space, also space. Every country has its own character, its own foods, in its own customs, its own way of dressing, lifestyle. And the country that was chosen as the environment in which 
which the Jewish mission can be fulfilled is Eretz Israel. So every, every place is unique, every person is unique, every moment is unique. And in contrast with the land of Egypt, in which the land is irrigated by the Nile, like in the land of Egypt, it doesn't rain, it never rains. But it's a very fertile land because it's irrigated by the river. So people never have to look up and, and pray to God that there should be sustenance for them. On the other hand, in Israel, if we don't pray and we don't look up and we're not praying to God that it should rain, we will not get the rain. There's times that there's so much drought in Israel that they take thousands and thousands of, of school children to the Kotel to cry to God and to pray to him that there should be rain. So, so it says here that uh, Hashem lured the Egyptian people into thinking that their strength and their might of my hand has accumulated this wealth for me. That they're their own makers, that Hashem doesn't help them, that they're the ones that uh, produce all these uh, delicacies in Egypt. We plant it, we grow it, we, 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 we pick it up. Hashem has nothing to do with it. And this is the way that God created the world, in a natural way, that people can believe that God has nothing to do with, with them. But in Israel, it's, it's a remembrance of every day. Every day in Israel, you remember how who runs the show. It, it, it's in, unbelievable how you live there by divine providence. God, God is in every corner. You can feel him. You can, you can see it in the people, in, in everything. So, for, because the next verse says, for you must remember the Lord your God, for it is he that gives you strength to acquire health, wealth. So this is the difference. So we must always remind ourselves that Israel is much more than a land where we can be safe and protected by our very special IDF or some sort of economic miracle that we should be proud of. We're proud of it. We're proud of all these uh, startups and all this uh, incredible technology that comes from Israel, which has benefited the world tremendously, like in medicine, in, 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 in in computers, like the whole world benefits from it. I, I say that if people really want to boycott Israel, they should throw away their iPads, their iPhones. If they have a, any disease, like for example, diabetes, they cannot use the insulin because it was uh, discovered in Israel. And all these things that have been discovered in Israel, people should really boycott them. because. But no, people know because they need them. So we see here that the most important thing for us to keep in mind about our loved land is that Israel is a place where the presence of God dwells and it's a place where it's more, more palpable. This is a place where I've seen people that have no connection whatsoever to their souls or to God and when they come there, they, they're, they're stirred up. I, I, I once encountered a kid that came to the to the Wailing Wall, to the Kotel, he couldn't stop crying. And he said to me, I, I don't know why. I don't know, how can I keep this feeling with me when I come back home? I felt God with me. So the, the divine intervention is mostly felt all the time in Israel. Israel is a place in which a Jew can realize his, his or her connection to God. The, the potential there is humongous. There's yeshiva, seminaries, all types of places where people can connect. And Israel represents the fusion of spirit and matter. That's what it is. It's a place where it's above above the material. It's the material with the spiritual. I remember, and I've said this many times before, when my oldest child went to Sam for a year in Israel, she was very much into fashion, and she had to be buying clothes every week. And one day she calls me and she says, Ma, you don't know, you don't understand. What's important there is not important here. It's meaningless. And it's true, people don't care about materialism in Israel. People are more simpler because they really value what is important. They value life, they value their families, they value, they value the, the land, the people. So w when we keep the spirit of Israel in our minds, we can bring that fusion wherever we are. And by this, we can permeate the whole world with the sanctity of the Holy Land. In the prophecies of, um, of the Messiah times, it says that when Messiah comes, the land of Israel is gonna expand to the whole world. The whole world is gonna be like the land of Israel, that the presence of God is gonna be felt everywhere. But meanwhile, well, we bring him, the Jew, 
his responsibility in the diaspora when he's outside of the land of Israel is to make that place like if it's Israel. Wherever you're living, wherever you're, you are, it's because that's where God needs you. He needs you there. Remember, you have a unique quality and a unique purpose. But in reality, the, the, the true purpose of a Jew in, in the diaspora, in exile, is to bring and permeate the whole world with the holiness of the land of Israel. God willing, uh, that Messiah should come very soon. So I wish you a blessed week and remember, live a little higher. Thank you.